road, Chevy's I think. Four Chevy trucks in a row. That's funny. Different generations too. I think they all look like fucking Silverados. That's funny. It looks like a Chevy, a little mat in the distance.
turn around. working the night shift at my local Wolbaums back when it used to be open 24 hours a day. There would normally be less than 10 customers throughout my shift, but I wouldn't get to sit around and do nothing though. They wanted me to work on stock when I wasn't helping a customer. It was a bigger Wolbaums, so oftentimes there may have been one other person in the building, whether it be someone working on stock or someone cleaning. This night, I was the only one working. I was working stock in the cereal aisle when I heard something fall over on the other side of the shelf in the next aisle over. I would always hear the door to the store sliding open. It was the loudest thing ever, so it kind of caught me off guard that there might have been a customer in the building. Of course, it wasn't weird. Yet. Not until I looked to my left and saw a man standing by the edge of the aisle shooting me a blank stare. Do you need something, sir? I asked him. Uh, no. Could, could you just point me to the eggs? He said. He wasn't normal looking. His face looked weird. Not exactly ugly, just unusual. Like his upper lip kind of came out too far. Almost like a Simpsons character. I was a bit uncomfortable that I had to deal with ringing him up. I hurried to finish the cereal aisle, and when I was done, I began to bring the U-boat cart to the back room. I was stopped halfway when the same guy cut me off through the middle section of the aisle. I want to note this guy was probably in his mid-thirties, and at the time I was only 22, though I looked much younger. The guy stopped me and started trying to make awkward small talk. 
He started by asking me my name, how old I was, if and where I went to school, and why I was doing the night shift. His questions started to get weirder when he asked me if I went to parties a lot and if I had a girlfriend. I told him I didn't, and then he asked me if I've ever had a boyfriend while putting his hand on my shoulder. I immediately started walking away with the cart, but he followed me. I told him I wasn't into whatever he was thinking about. I went faster and faster until I finally made it to the back storage room. He didn't follow me in. I wasn't supposed to stay back there for extended periods of time to avoid customer theft. I decided it would be best to just wait for him by the register so that he would ring his stuff up and leave. But I waited there for at least 20 minutes. He never came. I decided he was gone, and whether he stole the eggs and something else, there wasn't anything I could do now. I had to go to the bathroom, so I took a quick jog to the back of the store and into the employee bathroom. Moments after sitting on the toilet, my heart dropped into my stomach as I heard the bathroom door open. I choked the urge to say something. Something like, you can't be in here but I didn't want to give away my position. I lifted my leg so that I wouldn't be visible from under the stall, and what happened next was simply horrifying. I sat there for the longest time, looking at the floor, not moving a muscle. When I finally looked up, I could see an eye peering through the crack of the stall door. I screamed. I knew I was trapped. I knew I had one shot at making a move. I grabbed the box cutter in my pocket and began sliding it through the crack of the door, forcing him to move his eye away. I took that chance to slam the stall door open in his face and hightail it out of the bathroom and all the way out of the store. I called my boss at least five times before he finally picked up and explained everything. He told me to call the cops, and so I did. Of course, the man wasn't in the store anymore by the time the cops showed up. I only did the night shift twice after that and luckily didn't see the man again. I used to work the night shift at a gas station on the side of some highway in the country. From the hours of 12 a.m. to 6 a.m., the road was pretty dead. I would have maybe one or two people come in to pick cash in a whole night. It was a very boring and depressing job, especially doing the graveyard shift, but I had just finished college and I needed to pay off my loans. The only reason I kept this job was because my boss threw me an extra $5 an hour for doing the night shift. On this one cold December night, I was doing my usual thing, reading the newspaper, playing games on my phone and whatnot, when I noticed the headlights of a car pulling off the highway into the parking lot. It was a red pickup truck. Somebody stepped out and shut the door. I went back to reading the paper as I saw that he was standing by the gas pump. I assumed he wasn't paying cash. I looked up a few moments later and saw that he was still standing in the same position, staring at the gas pump. I almost felt obligated to go out and help him, he was obviously confused. I felt a cold chill run up my spine as I saw the six foot something tall man slowly turn his head to face me. I couldn't, I couldn't make out any features of his face, but I knew he was staring at me. I tried to pretend I didn't notice by going back to reading the paper. Of course, I wasn't really reading now. I was a bit shaken by the guy out there. I just wanted him to pay debit or credit and leave. I looked up and gasped as the man was now much closer to the front door of the building. It wouldn't have been so disturbing if it weren't for the fact that he wasn't moving. He was just standing still as before, still looking in my direction. I walked over to the door to get a closer look. All I could see in his face was still blackness. I locked the door and flipped the open sign to close down the door. I didn't care if this would possibly get me in trouble. I was not taking a chance because, quite frankly, I was scared shitless. I walked back behind the counter and sat down on one of the containers on the floor just so I couldn't see the man outside anymore. I stayed in that position for a good five minutes, texting every friend I have to see who was awake. I was desperate to tell somebody about this. When I finally got up to check that he was gone, I let out a full scream 
as the man was now right outside the door. I picked up the phone on the counter and called the police. The operator was reluctant to send somebody over because of the way I described the situation, but I persuaded them. I hid behind the counter, balled up like a child. I began to hear heavy thumps at the door, not innocent knocks to catch my attention. I mean thuds and thumps, trying to break down the door, and then eventually it finally stopped. I heard the sound of a car starting outside and then driving off. I looked outside and he was gone. A patrol cop along with a state trooper pulled into the parking lot. I reported the red pickup truck and told them which direction I thought he went in. I couldn't describe his face as all I saw was blackness. Of course, there wasn't much the police could do as the man didn't really do anything. I left that job a few months later to a job in the city. It was two years ago. I was called in to do the night shift, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. at 7-Eleven, since somebody called out. The store was located on a busy road in a rather quiet and rural area. During the night shift, you could expect anywhere from 10 to 20 people come in to buy a beer or something else. This one particular night, there was this one guy, mid-twenties, that came in. He started making weird noises, like loud yelling noises. I assumed he had some kind of mental disability. In fact, my brother has a mental disability, so I immediately felt sympathy for the guy. He walked up to the counter without any items, with his head facing me, but his eyes were looking up at the ceiling. I felt uncomfortable. I honestly didn't know how to deal with it. I tried speaking with him, but he only responded in loud noises. I kept checking if he was with someone outside, but he was alone. There weren't any cars in the parking lot, so I assumed he walked. He stood there for so long, looking up at the ceiling and making noises, that I tried to get him out by handing him a bag of chips and telling him he can go. I tried finding some kind of number to call for someone to help him. Then, out of nowhere, he finally turned around and walked out of the store. I felt so horrible for the man, but at the same time, I felt a bit creeped out. About an hour later, the phone on the counter rang. I picked up to hear the familiar yelling sounds of the man from earlier. He caught me off guard. I didn't know what to think, other than this has to be some kind of prank. I hung up on them and was now becoming paranoid of my surroundings, constantly checking the outside through the windows. Come four o'clock, the person working after me came in finally allowing for me to go home. It wasn't my problem anymore. I got home and threw all my stuff on the table, ready to get to sleep. But my phone rang within a minute after entering the door. I felt a chill run down my spine. Why would someone be calling at 4 a.m.? I could only imagine it was bad news. I braced myself and picked up the phone to hear the man again. I felt sick to my stomach as I listened to the loud noises he made. I struggled to slam the phone to the receiver. All night, I felt like I was being watched, even with all the blinds shut. And I could swear I heard strange noises coming from all over my house. I refused to get any sleep until the sun came up. Weeks passed and I had forgotten about the incident. Until one day, when going into the basement for the first time in a while, I found that papers had been scattered all over the floor, and when I went into the basement closet, I found writing on the walls. 7-Eleven had been written in Sharpie on the wall, along with the address to the 7-Eleven I worked at and my house address. The most disturbing part, I also found various kitchen knives along with a large pocket knife sitting in the closet. It started out as seemingly just an innocent person turning into something of a prank ultimately turned into something much more horrifying. He had been living down there for God knows how long, and I'm just grateful that, for whatever reason, he changed his mind and left, because I haven't seen or heard from him since. All I can say is that man is dangerously ill. I've worked in the K-9 unit for nine years, and I've worked my fair share of graveyard shifts. I've definitely come across weird things at night, but I'll never forget this one night. 
I worked with my dog Sammy, a German Shepherd. She was two years old at the time and was still kind of new to the job, just like me. I was driving down a road surrounded by crops when I spotted a suspicious looking white van parked inside the crops. Both doors were open. I flashed my lights to try and draw out whoever was there. Nobody came out, so I parked and scanned the place out quickly. Nobody was in sight, so I took Sammy with me to track down the driver of the van. Sammy started going crazy when we reached the trunk of the van. She was pulling so hard she almost broke off the leash. I opened the trunk to the van, and a blast of foul air hit me in the face. I almost passed out from the mix of the horrible smell and the pure shock of what I saw in the trunk. I counted seven full body bags, each with a pair of feet sticking out at the bottom. I requested immediate backup with my radio. I heard the sound of a twig snapping nearby, and Sammy just lost it. I lost grip of the leash, and she took off into the crops. I pulled out my gun and followed the sounds of her barking. As each and every crop hit me in the face, I felt as if something would reach out and grab me. I stopped when I could no longer hear Sammy's barking. But as I stopped, the sounds of movement did not. I realized I heard movement in all directions. I had never experienced such fear in my life. I stood still as the movement around me stopped. And then, out of nowhere, I felt two arms wrap around my throat. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't fight. I was going to die. And then, I heard the sound of Sammy's bark. Followed by the scream of the man choking me, as Sammy bit down on his leg. The next thing I did is something that I still question if it was appropriate doing to this day. I turned around and pulled the trigger, killing the man. I grabbed Sammy by the leash and ran all the way back to the car. I could tell people were following us from behind. I managed to make it to the car safely and drive a quarter mile down the road. I didn't stop to see which way they went. I didn't hold my ground. I fled like a coward. I cared much more about our lives than I did this job, and I'll still say that today. But it still pains me knowing how much of a coward I was. Backup arrived shortly, but the van was gone. I even failed to get the plate number on dash cam video, or even just writing it down. This was within my first few months on the force, but it made me feel like absolute shit for months to come. I, someone who was sworn to protect, let a van full of killers get away. would be gone all weekend. I rode my bike over and put it in his backyard before letting myself in through his back door. We played basically every video game he had, from FIFA all the way to Call of Duty, with popcorn and other junk food spilled out all over the floor. As the night progressed, we moved from video games to watching half a movie and getting bored, to doing prank calls at close to 10 o'clock. Anthony made a few calls to different pizza places. When it was my turn, I just dialed a few random numbers in hopes to get someone at their house. On, say, my fourth attempt, I finally reached somebody. A guy with a deep and rough voice picked up, answering with a yeah instead of a hello. Anthony's laughing in the background made me stumble with my words mid-sentence, ultimately cracking up into laughter. I had never done a prank call, so I sucked at it. The guy on the other end was silent. I regained a straight face and tried to continue with the call. It went something like this. Uh, sir, would it be alright if I borrowed one of the wheels from your car? What's your name, kid? My name is Bob. Really? You sure it's not Anthony? It hit me like a brick. I looked up at Anthony, whose face was noticeably full of fear. I hung up the phone, not wanting to be on the line with whoever that was for another second. Anthony, who the hell was that? I asked him. 
I, I, I don't know, he told me. Does your caller ID info display your name or something? No, it shows my dad's name. We hopped on the computer and did some research, trying to figure out how it was possible to get someone's name through their phone number. It didn't make sense how he could get Anthony's name so quickly. He was way too young at the time to be on any of those personal information sharing websites. We ended up asking a question on Yahoo Answers, since no one had a similar experience. The question turned up no answers. I suggested he call his dad, but he said he wasn't supposed to have anybody over for the weekend, so he didn't want to call. We planned on sleeping in the living room, so we just resumed watching the movie that we hadn't finished from earlier. Right after the phone call had left my mind, me and Anthony looked at each other when we heard his front storm door opening, and then the doorknob to the front door began to turn. It only was able to turn about halfway before the lock restricted it. Anthony turned off the TV, and I went over to the window to see who it was. I spread the blinds open. There was a tall guy standing outside. He noticed the blinds moving and turned to look at me. I practically threw the blinds back into place. Me and Anthony hid in the kitchen, listening for any more noises. We heard the sound of the gate to the backyard opening, as it was right outside the kitchen window. God damn it, I said. I forgot to shut the back door. Anthony urged me to run and shut it. I made it to the hallway leading to his back door, and froze. There was a silhouette standing outside the back door. I don't think he noticed me, but he was surely looking into the house. He opened the door and stepped inside. I tiptoed to the kitchen and motioned for Anthony to follow me upstairs. We made it to his room as quietly as possible, pulling the door shut to avoid making any noise. We crawled under his bed. He had cloth covering the bottom of his bed, so you couldn't see anything under it unless you actually moved the cloth. The doors downstairs all opened each one getting closer to the stairs. Thumps finally began up the stairs, and he was right outside the door now. The door to the room opened. I could hear Anthony's breathing. It was too loud. Footsteps moved over to the closet, and then the closet opened. I could hear the coat hangers being slid around as the fabric of the jackets and coats rubbed against each other. Footsteps moved over to the bed and stopped. I felt like my heart was about to explode out of my chest. Anthony's breathing was too loud. I had to cover his mouth with my hand. Nothing but silence in the room now. We laid still for so long, I almost thought he wasn't even in the room anymore. I moved my hand away from Anthony's mouth and whispered in his ear, You think we can make a run for it? He was about to answer when the most disturbing memory-haunting scream I'd ever heard filled my ears as Anthony was seemingly dragged out from under the bed. I crawled out and saw him struggling with the man. I desperately looked around for anything to use as a weapon. I settled with the screwdriver sitting on his nightstand. I hurried over to the man and drove the screwdriver into his back. He let go of Anthony as he let out a scream of agony, giving us time to get the hell out of the house. Running onto the road would give away our position too easily. It would take too long to make it to his neighbor's house. We dove for the tree line in the woods and took cover behind a bush, watching the house. The back door opened as the man stepped outside, looking around the backyard. He then looked out to the woods. I felt his eyes pass me as he scanned through the tree line. It seemed that it was too dark for him to see us. Then turned his head back in our direction. I ducked behind the bush. Joe, he's coming. What? Dude, get up, we gotta run. He was right. The man was approaching us fast. How could he have seen us? We ran through the woods with the leaves crunching under us, giving away our position. When Anthony tripped over something, I crouched down with him, hoping we had run far enough. Not even 20 seconds later, Oncoming footsteps from the direction we were running from came fast. They slowed down only two trees away from us as we lay face down in the leaves. Moments later, the footsteps take off in another direction. We waited until we could no longer hear them 
I took off back in the direction of the house. While running, over the sound of leaves crushing and my heavy breathing, I could swear I heard leaves crushing from behind us. We made it back to his backyard, into his house, and this time remembering to shut the back door. We were now able to call the police. Anthony stayed on the line with them, while I patrolled the back windows making sure nobody was out there. It was so dark though, I couldn't see anything. So I did something that seems stupid today. I turned on his backyard lights, and immediately in the distance, over by the woods, I saw him, standing in front of a big tree. He turned off back into the woods and disappeared out of sight. That was the last time me or Anthony ever saw him. I would be lying if I told you we heard the occasional knocks at our windows or something cliche. No, that was it. Five years have passed and nothing has happened. Do I wonder if it was somehow linked to the prank call? Maybe. Does it make sense? Not really. But yeah, this was the story of how me and my still best friend Anthony almost died during a break-in. Me and my wife have had our fair share of arguments, but there was this one night that she wouldn't stop bitching over the stupidest shit. It got to the point where I forgot to put the toilet seat down and she lectured me at the top of her lungs with an ear piercing voice that I just couldn't take it anymore. I called my buddy Paul up and he told me I could crash there for the night. I was exhausted and I didn't need to deal with my crazy wife at the time. Paul had a huge house, which was another thing my wife always yelled at me about, how all my friends have nicer houses than us. We had a few beers and had a bro chat. He suggested I stay there for as long as I needed, but I assured him I'd only stay for one night. I didn't want to be a bother. I slept in one of his guest bedrooms. Surprisingly, he has three guest bedrooms, but has only needed to use one of them so far. He never uses the other two bedrooms, and only plans on using them for a party or something like that. All three guest bedrooms in the house are lined up next to each other, while Paul's bedroom is across the hall. It's a weird setup for sure, but it let me hear strange noises coming from the next room over. I assumed it was Paul doing something in there, but it quickly got annoying, so I decided to just walk over and see what was going on. I tried the doorknob, but it was locked. I cracked the door open to Paul's room and asked him what the noise was. He was already in bed as well. He didn't hear anything. Upon asking why he kept the door locked, he told me he always keeps those two doors locked as he keeps some personal belongings in there. I warned him that there was a strange noise coming from the room and he told me to just go back to sleep and if I continue to hear it, come back to him. So I did. I went back to bed and the noises were completely gone now. A half hour passed, I was starting to drift off to sleep at last, when I heard the slightest tap on the wall. It came from the other side, the next room over. It was followed by a faint voice. I Alright, and that's where we're going to end for that. Stay tuned to be continued a little bit later. ran back to Paul's room. This time, he took me seriously. He got the key to the two doors and unlocked the one next to mine. We stepped inside and felt a breeze hit us on the way in. The window was completely open, along with the closet. We dug through the entire room. The bed had marks on it as if someone were on it. The closet was full of empty bags, and his valuable belongings that were in his drawers were gone. Paul suddenly ran out to the hallway. I was confused at first, but I caught on quickly as he was checking the other room. I was right by his side as he unlocked the door to the third guest bedroom, and the first thing we saw was a black figure jumping out the window onto the patio roof. Paul was about to jump out after him, but we instead both ran outside through the back door in hopes to catch him. He was gone already. It's a good thing we didn't catch him though, because what we found in this room was far more disturbing. The white sheets on the bed were stained with blood. The closet had the butcher knife he had been missing sitting on the floor with a few blood spots on it. And of course, all of his valuable belongings were gone. These people, most likely homeless and likely dangerous drug addicts, were living in his home for a, a little more than a week. He had even mentioned something about how fast his food goes, and yet he's so skinny when we were drinking. 
that made a lot more sense now. As far as we know, none of them were ever caught. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was my first sleepover, an important part of my childhood. He was my good friend. His name was Jordan. We were 10 years old. We had a huge basement where we could play video games until 1 in the morning and then sleep on the couches. Skipping the teeth brushing like two little rebels, we went straight to trying to get some sleep on the couches. I fell asleep with ease. I woke up at some unknown time. I realized the TV was still on with a blank screen. It was giving off a very dim light, but it was enough to notice something in the far corner of the basement by the stairs. It was some tall object. I didn't know what it was and I can't really describe how it looked. All I know is it almost reached the ceiling. The sound of the TV turning off and the small amount of light vanishing was almost enough to make me start screaming. I shut my eyes and just laid there motionless. I don't even remember falling back asleep. All I remember is waking up to a sudden and horrid screaming coming from upstairs. It was Jordan's mom. We woke up as well and we looked at each other before sprinting upstairs to his parents' room. His mom was sitting there crying as his dad was turning the room upside down looking for what she saw. He barged out past us looking for anybody in the house, but there was nobody in the house. No signs of entry or exit. I'm still friends with Jordan today, and the last time I brought this up, he said his mom doesn't like to talk about it, but she did once admit she saw a tall dark figure standing by their bedroom door. I'm undoubtedly sure that's what I saw in the basement that night. freshman in college. I came home this past week for a funeral, but let's backtrack a little. My senior year in high school, I was in the library during study hall doing some computer science work on the computer since my laptop at home didn't have JCreator on it. Anyways, this boy who was in my class sat next to me since those two computers were the only ones with JCreator. He was a really tall, very pale boy. He had long black hair that covered one of his eyes. He wore an anti-flag tee, ripped jean jacket, and Doc Martens. He never spoke to anyone in class, and I had never seen him with anyone else. So I took a seat, and he looked up at me like I committed murder. I quickly looked away and started rummaging through my bag as a distraction. As my head was down, I heard him chuckle and then mumble, Of course. I froze with my head still down towards my bag. I just dismissed it as him talking to his computer, as code can be quite frustrating. I sat back up and quickly typed in my login details. To break the awkwardness, I said, She assigns too much homework, I can barely keep up. His eyes stayed locked on the computer screen. You want the answers, don't you? I laughed and said, No thanks, I won't learn anything that way. Usually I would have said yes, but I didn't want to see his evil stare again. It was like he was staring into my soul. He laughed again in that creepy laugh. So creepy that I had to close my eyes and cringe. I opened them and looked over to see him gone. The strange thing was he left his flash drive. I waited about 10 minutes to see if he would come back, but he didn't. Study hall ended at 1 and it was 12.50. I decided I would take it and give it back to him tomorrow in computer science class. I threw it in a little box above my bed. Mm -hmm. Gotta admit, it was an awesome flash drive. It was a Swiss army knife with a flash drive in the middle. Here's the crazy part. After that, he never came to school again. He was notorious for being absent, so for the first month, no one batted an eye. However, May rolled around and we were all getting ready to graduate. I had completely forgotten about the flash drive until two days ago when I came home. I needed one and I remembered I still had that boys. I scanned it with my Norton and it said it was all safe. 
I was planning to delete all this stuff so I could put my PowerPoint for business class on it. Naturally, however. Science. I opened it, and all the answers to every assignment was there. I thought, damn, maybe that's why he left it, so I could copy off of him. Maybe because he knew he was never coming back. I went back, and the second folder was music. I kind of had to open that one to see what he listened to. Surprisingly, not what I expected. There were only three songs. Running on Empty by Jackson Brown, White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane, and Helter Skelter by The Beatles. I went back again. There was an untitled folder. Inside it was AP Literature. There were a bunch of essays and various junk. There was one called The Best Doc. I opened it, and it was merely a 10-page document of notebook pages filled entirely with his first and last name, handwritten. I went back again. This is where it gets weird. He had taken pictures of the emergency escape plan posters on the door in every classroom. There was a picture of a lit cigarette on the bathroom floor, and another picture of some coins on the bathroom floor with a yellow post-it note next to it saying, CHUMP CHANGE in all caps. Now this is the weird part. There was a picture of me, taken while I was reading a book in class. From the looks of it, it was my English class that he was not in. There was also a document titled, Rest in peace too, dot dot dot, but it was empty when I opened it. I still have no <laughs> idea if this was a joke or not. For all I know, he never showed up again because he realized that he lost his hard drive. This story happened a few years back to me and a friend who I'll call Ali. We're now both 15, making us 12 when this story occurred. Okay, so me and Ali have been friends since second grade, and we would usually spend all weekends and free time together. We always have been into paranormal and ghost stuff. We had every reason to believe that every house we ever went into was haunted. We would go on ghost hunts like the TV shows with a flip phone to record the sounds. But there will always be one night that stands out to me that still haunts me to this day. It was around midnight, and we were hyper and awake like most kids of our age on the weekends. So we decided to do another ghost hunt in my house. We got the flip phone ready, and we borrowed my dad's touchscreen to actually videotape. This was the first and last time we used that. My basement was not like most, because the house I was living in at the time was very old and therefore very old fashioned. So down the stairs, there's one main big room that we use for storage, and a little further there was another medium sized room for the washer and the dryer, and the farthest was a small little cell type room that we never used, mainly because everyone was too creeped out to go in it. Me and Ali walked down the stairs, turned on the camera and flip phone recorder, and we started asking the usual questions you would see on TV like, is there anybody here, give me a sign if you're here, and that type of thing. We finally got tired of it and went back upstairs and into my room to be so excited as we reviewed our first video recording. This was a big step for us because we wanted to be ghost hunters so bad. We were watching and we kind of got disappointed as we didn't find anything in the video or voice recording. Usually we would make something up like a footstep that wasn't ours to make us feel less bad but this time we were so excited about the video we didn't even want to make anything up. We couldn't sleep so we played a few board games and then we both agreed to review it again because maybe we missed something. And oh boy we did. While reviewing the tape again, we both could just feel this bad energy coming from it. I guess we didn't realize it before because we were too filled with excitement. We went on anyway, and as we paid more attention, we could actually hear footsteps that weren't ours. Then what showed up on the tape, I still see when I close my eyes. It was the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. The camera was on Ali, and behind her was this figure that looked like a distorted, almost human thing with bright white eyes that almost seemed as if they were watching you through the video. At that point we shut it off, and we were both in complete shock. We couldn't tell my father as he was asleep being so early in the morning. We both decided to just not tell anybody and keep it our secret. Even though we never went into that basement again, we both still talk and sometimes even dream about it. To this day, I don't know if it was our imagination or if there was something with us in that basement, but I'll never go in there again.
So this all happened during Halloween in 2014. My name is Max, and I'm from a small town in Finlay, Ohio. I used to go to a high school at County School about 10 minutes from where I lived called Van Buren High School. Van Buren was a nice little village with good people for the most part, but the only problem was that there were some evil creeps that could be found there if you knew where to look. The biggest hotspot for them to be found was the Van Buren State Park. Everyone knew that the state park had a little infamy to it, as it was known for some rapes and the like. Now I've been to the park many times with friends and classmates, and nothing bad ever happened to us, so I never thought much of it. I have a lot of good memories of the place actually, like the many times my friends and I would bike the trails and set off the works bombs in the woods or go fishing in the lake. However, fast forward to my senior year at Van Buren on the day of Halloween. My friend Ian and I saw the darker side of Van Buren State Park. The summer before my senior year, I enlisted in the Army National Guard, so it was important that I worked out and stayed in shape. So that day, I asked my best friend Ian if he wanted to go run the trails in the park with me after school, and he said he would, as he likes to work out when he can as well. It was probably about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when I pulled into one of the parking lots, waiting for Ian to meet me there, when I saw this old silver car with a bald and just disturbing man suspiciously sitting in the lot. Knowing that creeps hang out at the parks, I glanced over to check out what he was doing when I noticed he was staring at me and would not take his eyes off of me. It was a very unsettling stare, one that made him look hungry and me uncomfortable. His eyes were wide open and I'm pretty sure he had a frown or maybe a grin. We made eye contact and he nodded at me as if he were trying to say hello but would not drop his glare. I nodded back but broke eye contact since I was pretty uncomfortable. However, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that he was still staring. At this point I had enough and I sped out of there and pulled out of the parking lot. But when I looked in my rearview mirror, I saw he was following me. This made me floor my gas pedal and I sped to my high school parking lot where I lost him. I called Ian and told him that I was at the high school and that he might have to deal with this creep alone. And then my stomach sank. I got a text from Ian saying here. So I made my way back there. And sure enough, right when I pulled in, I saw Ian's car and two spaces away was the scary bald guy in the silver car still staring. I nodded to Ian for him to follow me in his car to a different parking lot at the park and we made our way over there. We were safe. 